<clears throat> what's happening what's going on welcome back to the agassino zinger show episode number 142 with me your host agostino zinga how you doing how you feeling motherfuckers hope you're feeling well fuck faces and all that malarkey i'm doing very well actually thank you for asking my shoulder blades are still um hurting actually my lats maybe as you'd call them here um from the strenuous exercise i've been doing over the last couple of weeks loads of overhead presses loads of running and all that stuff you know trying to get my body nice and where it should be lower this camera a tiny bit trying to get my body where it should be for the start of the new year you know i'm continuing on as i meant to as i want to end the year and yeah i think i look i tweaked something on my shoulder so it was paining me just a little bit these last couple of days but you know what nothing a good old run can't sort out which is what i'm gonna do later I'm gonna go for a nice little four to five mile run. Need to decide them um, once I'm out there and I start feeling my heartbeat racing. Something I've been doing quite often actually in the last two miles when I run, because how far I run, like the last mile, the last last one to two miles, I'll turn my music off and just start listening to my breathing. Because obviously, when you're listening to your music, a lot of people say, which um, I've heard people mention before. Um, I heard it on Joe Rogan. I think he mentioned something along the lines, and a few, a few other people have heard mention it too. I think I might have heard Rich Roll say it too that um, sometimes running a rap music is better because you get a real judge of where your endurance capability is. Because sometimes when you run with music, you tend to sometimes go with the how do you say? You tend to go with the. Um, I won't say the beat, but like the music aids to kind of give you a bit of a pep, right? You go, you sprint when may, maybe if you want to listen to music, you won't probably have the capacity to sprint. And sometimes it can um, hide your de- deficiencies in terms of breathing, in terms of stride pattern, in terms of how heavy your feet are landing. So when you suddenly pause the music, you go, Doop, you pull out your headphones, you realize how heavy you're breathing. You realize if you're breathing continuously through your mouth, like, <sighs> As if you, do you know what I mean? As if you're struggling for air under underwater or something. When in theory, what you should be doing is trying to breathe entirely through your nostrils. And try, trust me, trust me when I say this. It sounds, it sounds easy, but try and run, right? Or just in everyday life, try and walk around, close, have your mouth closed, and breathe in, and breathe only solely through your nose. But you're aware of this now, because usually maybe you might do it unconsciously. But now, I told you and you're aware of it. See how hard it is to do for the rest of the day. Just breathe entirely um, in through your nose and out through your nose. It's so hard to do. But that's what you're meant to be doing when you're running. You're meant to be only using your mouth to br- to kind of take in oxygen when you're really um, about to hit your kind of endurance capability wall or your threshold. That's when you're meant to like <gasps> suck in as much air as you can and go from there. But you're not really meant to be taking in that much air through your, your mouth. I'm, I'm assuming because um, the nostrils has those little hair follicles inside it or little hair little hairs that you're meant to have in it that are meant to clean the air that's coming in through you there's something about it right that helps that's why why you're not meant to usually um you know um, what you call it shave the entirety of your the inside of your nose you're meant to leave some of the hairs in there because it actually aids with your breathing so i'd imagine you know some of the reason why is because as per usual if if you've if ever you've kind of like run in the cold weather and you haven't wrapped up warm or covered your neck or you've been mouth breathing the next day you get a cold usually because you're breathing entirely through your mouth so these are little things i'm trying to do over the last couple of days some some things harder than the other but you know it's a challenge man it's the beginning of the year you got yourself set yourself a challenge you got to try aim for it you might come sh- come up short but in the end you're hoping somewhere along the line usually towards you know marchy kind of times you're like you look back on it and you think wow because obviously January goes by in a fucking flash, right? We're already approaching the middle of January now. And it's already been two weeks or something. Then February comes along, which is a super short month. And then suddenly you're in March. You start realizing, oh, wow, look at the work I did in before. Do you know what I mean? So that's why usually it's, it's quite good. Even if you've missed a couple of days, even if you haven't done what you're meant to be doing the last few days and you missed a few days here and there, try and pick up the mantle, try and get back on the wagon in january because when february comes around you'll be thankful you gave yourself that little bit of a buffer in terms of getting used to a new habit getting used to doing a new thing and then by the time march comes around you're already three months into the year why not carry on until the until for, for another two months right or another three months right to make it six why not do that and then you're half a year then you'll be like you know what i'm at six why not why not carry on until eight months then all of a sudden you know what i've only got four months left until the end of the year let's just do that so little steps little steps little steps but yeah i'm feeling good feeling nice coffeeed up as you can tell got my eggs inside of me had a bit of sourdough bread earlier as well to kind of spruce up because i know i'm gonna go running so i need the carbohydrates to keep me keep me going i've got a salad in the fridge i'm gonna have later on and a dinner 
and um yeah feeling good man 16 hour fasting every day life is life is where it should be right now exactly where it should be everything that's happening to me right now or where i am in life is exactly where i should be and tomorrow's gonna bring a brighter and better day this is a message brought to you by now nah, forget all that anyway enough about me enough about what i do enough about all them things there let's get into some hot and heavy topics because i've got some hot and heavy topics to get rid of i've still got bare things in this list i've i've, I've saved from last year that i didn't end up getting through because i ended up waffling in the beginning so we're gonna get in quick get in new get it started and we're gonna go for it let's do it number one gigs has got a new album coming out anyone else hyped i am super 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 hyped um I've always, again, I think uh, most people in London, for the most part, have always had a very strong connection to gigs. When um, the whole SN1, South London, rap, hip hop kind of scene came out through the back end of Grime, when that was sort of dying, it kind of gave it a new resurgence. Loads of people came out from that crew, like Young's Teflon, a bit of Krypton Kona a bit later, but gigs and all those people, and Sheik Carleone, and Sheik, Sheik, Sheik Carleone? Yeah, Sheik, Sheik, Sheik Carleone. There's a few others as well in that kind of group were the first to kind of popularize or bring about, oh, and obviously my guys, Roadside G's. Um, they were one of the one of the most former groups, but it all came out from that kind of South London bubble, right? That kind of aggressive, drill based um, rap. Do you know what I mean that was very much um, based in real actions or real activities that were going on in around the area at the time? And of course, it was a fucking scary time. But usually, the most scariest eras, you know, you think about uh, New York in the seventies and eighties. You think about Berlin in the in the early nineties. The most scariest places were always the most interesting. So in that kind of scary, fucked up era, loads of amazing music came out, loads of amazing artists came out, there was amazing producers, blah, blah, blah. Some of them went on to bigger, better things. Some of them kind of fell by the wayside. But one of the people kind of flying the flag and some of this kind of been a permanent fixture within the UK rap scene for the most part has been Gigs. He's gone for an interesting career. You know, just when he got signed, he got locked up for a while. Then he came back out again and somehow managed to pick up his momentum. And it looks like when he came back out, in my opinion, again, I'm not sure what anyone else thinks, but I think prior to him, going out it kind of felt like he was going to get whitewashed by the industry the industry was going to kind of put him in a blazer uh make him change his name to i don't know um uh fucking giga factory or some shit you know you happen to get gets right ghetto my I'm, I'm even calling him gets it's been so long but ghetto one of my favorite grammar suits of all time that was something that really hurt me when he had to when he finally got signed he finally was trying to pop into the mainstream you know because back then especially Especially a few years ago, there wasn't really a blueprint. I don't think it existed. We didn't have a, a big enough scene. I don't think kids cared enough because you see people like Hedy One nowadays, right? You see videos of girls, um, usually white girls in fucking far-flung places in the UK, uh, rapping along to one of Hedy One's songs. And you think, oh, shit, right? Like, these guys are winning, doing exactly, doing everything they want, like, without compromising, right? They're not having to change themselves. They're not having to fucking relax their hair, put on blue contact lenses and do some bullshit in order to kind of appeal to um, the middle of the UK, right? They can appeal to them by just saying, speaking the truth. And it's something that's captured the youth uh, market for the most part. But back then, when Getz and all those guys were around, even Wiley, even during the Roll Deep days, and maybe sometimes a few, maybe in the early stages when Skepta was around the first couple of albums, even though he was still did a good job of kind of maintaining who he was in the public eye, I think uh, Getz kind of suffered because he came around at a time when, you know, there was a lot of confusion. A lot of those guys thought they needed to be on top of the pops. They needed to be on uh, BBC One Extra, all those kind of things in order to have a successful career, right? Maybe the internet wasn't what it was now. Or loads of things that happened in those kind of areas that kind of led to it and obviously somebody like a gets who i imagine is quite independently minded quite strong willed was convinced into changing his name from ghetto which is probably one one of the greatest rap names out there if you think about it if you think about it right considering how he is and how he goes on um he had to then change his fucking gets which is like ugh, you know of course he says that it it, it, it was it, it was how he referred to himself in rap sometimes in in abbreviated sense but you know for him to change his name it was a fucking shame and it felt like gigs have to do the same thing when he went to prison but when he came back out he kind of it seemed like he doubled down on who he was and just gave us un, unadulterated unfiltered uh gigs and sn1 kind of vibes and obviously um the co-sign from drake um obviously helped things as well but overall i think in the uk his le legacy was fucking solidified and i was a big fan of his and i think the last album actually landlord there was a few track it was quite different from subs obviously done he had a really good mix of like you know uh sound things that you traditionally associate with with gigs and just like you know commercial things that might work in terms of the top 100 or whatever um charts people um uh, pay attention to so i remember i think he had a track with deneo was that lockdown was that lockdown 
Was it Lockdown? Was that? Uh, yeah, I think that was Lockdown. Um, what album is Lingua? What, what track is... What, what album is Lingua on? Is Lingua on the mixtape? Wamp to them. Might be on that, right? Is Lingua on Wamp to them? Yeah, it is. So he's got Lingua. So yeah. So imagine. He had a very, very, very good run. Gigs, I think. I'll get it up here on screen. So Gigs, studio albums. You've got here Landlord, which I was a fan of. But that came out in 2016. So that's, that's a good little... That's a good little back-to-back that he's done so far. And then... And then um. Wipe to them was sort of like I say a mixtape, right? For the most part, right? Mixtape that went number one, well, number two, number two as well. There, so on landlord, you've got some pretty solid tracks here on landlord, right? Um, what did I love? I love of, of of course, whipping and scourging was a big track. Just swerving, the process I really love. Lockdown I love. Slipping I love. Savage I love. Lyrical combat I love. Lyrical combat kind of introduced me to Cass is Dead. If you're not sure, Cass is Dead is I recommend you check him out. Really, really great um UK artist. Um. But that kind of introduced me to him. Um, and that was amazing. So check that one out. And then after that, he had Wamp to them, right? Wamp to them. Wamp to them, right? And um, this was a nice one too. Uh, you got Gully Niggas in there. You got Ultimate Gangster, Straight Lifestyle, Time's Ticking, Lingua, obviously, one of my favorite tracks, a track that I play all the time when I'm DJing. Um, obviously, Outsiders with DWE and Footsie, that was a big track. Uh, Peligro as well with Dave. So, awesome, 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 awesome album. So, now he's got a new one coming out, and I think he just put out, um, I think he's put out a trailer for it, which I haven't watched. I'm going to watch it live, man. Live, live, live with my podcast listeners. So, let's check this out here. Let's see if I can get it up there. Um, I think it's called, what is it called? The Boss or something? What is it called? Uh, so, that one's called Landlord. So, this, what's this one called? It's a continuation of, um, what you call it? Cancel, <laughs> uh, cancel at- attendance, nicknames or whatever. So yeah, it's called Big Bad Album Trailer Number One, right? So let's check this out and see what my man Gigs is saying. And obviously, and also, you know what as well? He survived without having to change his name, like completely. Because obviously, Ryan Giggs, big player. But I think if Ryan Giggs was English, maybe he'd have to change his name, right? Ryan Giggs being Welsh, no one gives a fuck about Wales here in the UK. But he never really had to. He never, he never had to change his name, which is something that I always thought he would have to like abbreviate his name or have it, you know, G dot I dot G, you know, kind of like a Will I Am sort of fashion, right? Maybe I thought he had to do that kind of thing, um, but he didn't have to do that. So that was awesome. So anyway, enough about that. Let's check this out. <laughs> Nice. So in this video, he's what is he like a King Kong character, right? Gigs' athleticism is on zero point five, though, isn't it? Fucking hell! Look how hard that was it to jump that. <laughs> Gigs on running it. Magic Gigs running. He must look mad running. <laughs> that SN One chain is fucking bad, isn't it? That's like our, that's the UK Rockefeller chain, isn't it? SN One chain, no? Because it's a very precise thing. It's only, you know, it's only for people from a particular set. Obviously, from South for the most part. Getting that chain is a big look. streets of London as a giant figure continues to cause destruction, carnage like we've never seen before in the capital city. Oh, Madam, oh what have you seen? He's, he's a so That's a model, isn't it? I forgot her name. Oh. Nice. And there you have it. People so running big for and their bad. lives. <laughs> scared as the authorities try and tackle a menace in the capital city. Yes, Gigs. Sick. Yo, this comes out and this flipping album smashes. Imagine what Wireless is going to be like when he performs this. Or album launch, whatever, right? Hopefully it does have a big one with Boiler Room or something. I'm definitely getting myself down on that one. Slaps a helicopter out from the air. Are we going to hear those bars, you reckon? Slap a helicopter from the air. Call me King Kong or something, right? We're going to hear that. Big bad, can't wait to see that. The album outward looks a bit dead though, but the, the trailer is fucking awesome. Cannot wait to see that album coming out. So that's coming out when? It says in the video, does it say in the video? Just so big and bad. Just so big and bad. February 22nd. So it's February 22nd, we're gonna see uh, <laughs> Gigs, that's awesome. I love that ad clip actually. It's just so big and bad. 
So yeah, Gigs album coming out February 22nd. Watch out for that. I'm a big fan of his. If you're not a big fan, get on that train, man. Get on that train. There's enough time, enough room for us. So hopefully album launch, we'll see it sometime before that. I'm assuming end of January, maybe beginning mid, beginning of Feb. Might be a boiler room thing. Might be his own thing. It might be an announcement. It might be like a little pop-up thing, similar to what Skepta did underneath that bridge. And sure, this album might be cool. But whatever it is, I'm putting myself on the list because I'm a huge Geeks fan. One of the, one of the hugest out there, actually. Oh. Cool. Anyway, apart, apart from that, let's roll on to the next topic here. <laughs> this made me laugh. It shouldn't make me laugh. I know because you know everyone's kind of woke and no one wants to laugh at things. But this made me laugh a lot, and I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm hoping other people will laugh at this too. So I saw this on the Fashion Law earlier on today because I remember I think I saw an article about it earlier. Um, on twitter but obviously i wanted to see what the fashion journalist had to say about this and get that one deep it did make me laugh a little bit right so um there's this story that came out um, and the headline is this is on the, the fashionlaw.com one of my sites that i kind of go to for all kind of fashion industry sort of stuff if you want to learn about trademarks you want to learn about copywriting if you want to learn about uh, people stealing other people's designs you want to learn about moves within the fashion industry you want to learn about merchandising business investment all that stuff all that stuff that kind of the background stuff that you love in here you know because fashion is full of we love all these kind of industry new stuff right and um, it's all well and good following your main designers your creative directors your art directors your stylists whatever they may be but the ones that i kind of want to hear about is that the movers and shakers who's behind who's who's pulling all the strings and making these things happen or making them not happen so this headline came out the other day um which made me laugh um which shouldn't make me laugh but it says that uh, machino has a code word for black shoppers according to a damning lawsuit so machino which has had the resurgence underneath jeremy scott who's kind of you know um up the kind of campness and uh uh, the showmanship of Machino, who's kind of turned it into a bit of a pastiche of itself. Um, it's sort of, you, you're not sure if you're in on the joke or if the joke is on you for the stuff that you buy, whether it's iPhone covers, whether it's handbags, whether it's trousers, jumpers. There's little funny pokes that he's taking at the industry and at himself and at the customers that buy it that sometimes make you feel like you've been taking the piss out of. But in the most part, everyone kind of has, you know, a, a lot of time for Machino because, you know, they've kind of, he's done a good job in terms of uh, reigniting a brand in a contemporary way without it being overtly referential without it being overtly pastiche which kind of is a bit um contradictory to what i said earlier but it kind of skirts on that line i think it's operating that line it does a good job of it um so um and the most part the only people that you do see wearing the the, the brand of course and again this is only my my experience anecdotally talking from my perspective of living in london the only people i see wearing machine are asian people and that would be specifically chinese um students that come over who love the cover kind of the covers who might love some of the little trinkets you put on bags the handbags themselves or the jumpers sometimes the shoes um i see a lot of people wearing that and the other people i see who are wearing it are maybe black people and then the other group of people i see wearing it are the kind of wavy garments crew people right who specifically aren't you know they're probably majority white but you know there's people in there that are are from other backgrounds but for the most part they are only fond of kind of old school archive machine vintage machine for the most part they're not necessarily into stuff jeremy scott is doing but sometimes you've seen them kind of mix and blend some stuff in together but those are the people i see wearing those kind of things right so it's not it usually isn't the people that they have on their own ways for them for instance right it usually doesn't whatever they want it to look like machine or jeremy scott it doesn't look like that in the street it looks completely different it's one of those weird brands i think similar to like balmain right um you remember when balmain jeans were big um the people that you see wearing them were rappers and they're wearing them in a very rapper way but when you saw barman jeans on the runway they looked nothing like how they were being styled in real life like they completely took them out of any sort of context but i mean wanting to put them in right whether it's that kind of you know very well to do uh posh parisian uh player or flipping batch or whatever it was it was just put in the context of like these guys in the hood like these how these jeans fit they like the fact that they had those kind of motorcycle knees on the front do you know what i mean there's they, they they didn't care how it was being styled in there and i think machine was the same sort of way they wanted to look one way they wanted to look like this kind of reference to 80s um hollywood do you know what I mean? When money was flowing in, when the coke was coming over from Colombia or uh, whatever it may be, but it doesn't look like that in real life. So it's always funny whenever you see those kind of brands who want to look like one thing, but then their customers tell them, no, 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 this is what we want it to say. And then they then have a disparity with how they kind of, the customers that come into the store doesn't necessarily match up to how they want their client to look like. And this obviously um, article kind of points towards it. So this is an article that I saw in um, the fashion law. I'm going to try and get up on the screen here, actually make it full screen so everyone can see it. Transform, fit to screen, boom, boom, boom. 
So this article is on fashion law. I'll get up on here now. The fashion law machina has had a code word for black shoppers, according to a damning lawsuit. Uh, machina has, ha has a code word for black shoppers, according to a damning lawsuit uh, filed against the American arm of the Italian fashion brand. Former machina employee, Shalmei uh, Latadel, Lat Lat Latelade, 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 yeah, um, who filed a lengthy complaint against the brand in California. Um, state court on Friday claims that Ra Rana Selbach, a manager, was Hollywood Los Angeles based Machina Output, who is named as a defendant in the case called non celebrity black shopper Serena and would encourage staff members to closely watch and even follow them. So, this is, in, this is a, a Machina store in West Hollywood, right? And I would assume most, you know, I've been to LA only once, don't get me wrong, and I went to that area. And for the most part, people who are shopping there, you know, especially in those kind of stores like Machina, aren't going to be white right they're going to be from wherever or if they are going to be white not going to be conventional um, they're not going to be middle america white they might be white european they might be russian they might be um uh, eastern european they might be middle eastern right or whatever it may be i won't say middle east people are white don't get me wrong but they're not necessarily anyway so this is strange so this manager had something against black shoppers who weren't celebrities and he called them serena as a code word but Serena, what is that? Serena Williams? What, what's Serena Williams do? Serena Williams Jack something back in the day. We don't know. So, Miss uh, Latterdale, who had been employed by Machino as a sales supervisor since June 2015, asserts that she was wrongfully terminated last spring. Following an ongoing and atrocious harassment and discrimination based on her status as a black Haitian American woman, in addition to Machino's regional manager, uh, Rana Selbach allegedly stealing some 4% of her commissions, refusing to give her mandatory vacation or clothing allowance. This is standard retail. All retail managers are like this, isn't it? Some re not all, but there is a big s segment of retail managers who are just fucking dickheads, and they just do this. This is just this is something they always enjoy, right? Taking your commission, taking a Kyle commission, not giving you a holiday when you want your holiday, when you book it way in advance. All this, not I remember with one manager that used to do that, um, in a shop I used to work at before, who was kind of like I was, I was always kind of prepared with my holidays because I knew eventually, you know, eventually I knew I didn't want to work in the workplace anywhere. I wanted to have to do my own thing. I didn't want to have to be employed for the worst part. So I always had the mindset of like, if I'm going to have a job, I'm going to give myself a reward, right? And the reward was either you're going to, every time you get paid by it or something nice, or at least try and schedule in two days of holiday per month, right? Even if you're not going to go anywhere and you're just going to stay in your house, just do it. Just because it's going to make the job worthwhile. It's going to give you a bit of distance. It's going to give you a bit of perspective. You can go away from work, kind of close your laptop and kind of get out there and brew out world and come back and, you know, have more energy to kind of go about things. So I always, I always have to, I would always put my holiday in um, ahead of time because, you know, just in case, even if I didn't go to the festival, even if I didn't go on my holiday, I would just have the date free anyway. So sometimes these managers would be at dickheads who would kind of punish the people who would who were more prepared or who had foresight and tell you, even though you submitted your summer holidays in February, you have to wait until fucking April when everyone else did theirs or, or until you got all the requests in to, for, them, for them to approve you. And then by the time it came around to approve, guess what? Yours wasn't approved. Dickheads, right? Those managers always exist. I don't know why. It's just a thing. I don't know if it's a power trip or whatever it may be, but there's something about a retail manager um, that just they just have this I don't know and again I, I don't know whether it's just not their fault I mean, maybe it's just an idea of like as soon as someone asks you permission for something you just you just suddenly you get the urge to say no or to like throw up a barrier because they're asking you permission you feel like you got power like oh you you're asking me permission oh okay that means I'm important right and then suddenly you start to get on your high horse start to black like, you know put your shoulders back and you start to get a bit a bit pointy and all that malarkey i don't know if it's that or i don't know if it's just like generally the profile of somebody that will do a job like that a retail manager who kind of look after 27 odd staff who change every fucking year right because of the retention rate in those kind of industries isn't that high people always come and coming in and out in and out it probably has to be a certain type of profile right you can't be the most well-adjusted human being to kind of do a job probably it's probably not the best way to go about it i don't know but those managers are dickheads um big, big up the good ones but big up the dickheads too or don't big up the dickheads actually fuck the dickheads so this suit continues um let's get up on here so it continues um da -da 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 -da. Uh, hostile environment sabek racial and aminus was clear according to the complaint uh so t t um, she would verbally abuse latter day calling her names yelling and berating her standard in particular latter day states that celibate called her ghetto and a thief Woohoo! and she practiced voodoo due to her haitian heritage jesus christ i think when you work in a place and the manager's calling you a calling you ghetto or saying you're a thief or you know anytime someone has to call you names i think it's done you have to just hand in your resignation and walk i think i don't know how people honestly like 
I've, I think I've mentioned it a few times, you know, people um, who kind of, you know, have this, you know, um, that hold employment up on this, you know, hallowed turf and put jobs up on a pedestal and will kind of, you know, um, uh, forsake any kind of morality, any kind of dignity in order to kind of keep their job. I've never really got that. I, I never really got that thing. But again, when you get older, you start to realize people have responsibilities. Sometimes stuff, the work, the job that you're doing has a big responsibility outside of yourself. You have to kind of take yourself out of it, not be so selfish, blah, 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 blah. Right? I understand that. No problem. Sometimes you have to swallow some things, you know, to kind of get to where you want to get to. And, you know, sometimes you have to just work where well, you have to work. No biggie. But I think once it gets to the point of name calling, especially in managerial terms and all that sort of stuff, I think it's, it's the beginning or the end. It's like, um, imagine if you had an argument with somebody you work with and it suddenly got to blows and one time outside of work, don't get me wrong, it did happen at work, but outside of work, you go into a fisty fight. Like you can't then go back into work and suddenly everything be okay. You know what I mean? It's bad enough when you have an argument with a customer and you have to work the next day, how it plays on your mind or how annoyed that you are. Da, 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 da. Imagine with a staff member, Imagine then you come to blows. Imagine it's a manager. Imagine they're calling you names. I just think at that point, you have to really look at your options and really assess whether or not this is the be best place for you to be because like it or not, in those instances, when it comes to manager or employee, usually more likely than not, even if you're in the right, even if you're in the right, even if you did nothing wrong and this person is just hammering you and telling you all kind of nonsense and trying to, um, what do you call it? Trying to put the blame on you and whatever it may be. Even if these things are true, even if, if these things are true, you are always going to be the one to get fired. That's what's going to happen. It's not going to be the other way around. Not going to work the other way around. No one else is going to fire the other person. They're going to fire you, 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 you. You're the one that's you're the one that's dispensable. Because managers, for the most part, they're quite hard to come by. Especially the good ones in retail. Especially the ones that don't mind doing the job. Especially the ones that want to do the want to get involved in firefights. So they're always going to side with the manager, unfortunately. So I think when everyone's name calling you, just hop the fuck out. Get out. Get out there as soon as possible and find something else to do. I think, in my opinion, again, this is just me talking. Anyway, let's continue on. Um, she called her ghetto. She said she practiced voodoo because she's from Haiti. Because she's from Haiti, and on more than one occasion, drew attention to her natural kinky hair, which um, the manager allegedly said was not a professional look. Fucking hell, that's mad, isn't it? Well, we, we, you do hear a few times. I remember hearing it at Salvages too. The guys have to kind of like make sure they get haircuts. They don't. They don't essentially say you can't have an afro, but you have to keep it well kept in that regard, which is understandable. If you're working in a luxury department store, you can't have your hair looking dusty or messy, whatever it may be. But to berate somebody because their hair isn't relaxed in a kind of western european way is nonsense I, I hopefully it's not that hopefully it's just a look of like look come on trim your edges ma i mean get some ha um hair and tail on your what you got or whatever that thing is on your on your hair whatever but if it's something talking about how your natural look isn't nice then i'm not with that at all such racially motivated harassment allegedly extended beyond um Beyond letter though to Machino customers as well. As set forth in the compliance, so back and forth, she is spilling all the tea, this girl, bruv. Everyone's getting it. So um the the sales assistant um or super sales supervisor, sorry, um enforced no, the manager, sorry, enforced a specific protocol when a black individual who was not a celebrity did not have an outward appearance of money via diamonds or name brands. Jesus Christ. And who she believed couldn't afford the items in the store, entered into the store. In addition to the Serena code word, Selbeck would take pictures of their license place in the store parking lot and recommended that others also do the same. Jesus Christ. Um do the same thing, would refuse to pull them items from the back from them for to try on and would uh, engage in other acts that cause them to feel de degra degradation, humiliation, harassment, and discrimination. That is fucking awful. That is awful. That is awful. Number one, of course, I think we've known for the longest time there has been a... I've worked in retail, so I've kind of seen it from both ends. I know there's been a lot of discrimination towards people who don't look like they have got money in order to buy the items in your store, whether they're black, white, whatever. Any store you work in, especially in London, they always have that um, at the forefront of their mind, which is why most stores you walk into, they'll have a random person standing next to the um the scanners on the front of the door greeting you they're not greeting you because they like you they want to say hello it's usually it's kind of a a, a deterrent for any shoplifters right because the idea is that it, which is a which is a flawed idea right because if you want to steal you're going to smart like the best um pickpockets the best thieves out there are the most charismatic ones ones that you have no idea they're doing it and i even remember there was a video actually um i remember seeing a video of kunle uh, it's not from Iraq, um, the 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 legendary um, New York City graffiti crew. I remember he was saying something along the times of like when he's racking, which is you know going to stores and stealing graffiti um, graffiti cans, 
I remember him saying something along the lines of the best way to do it is to engage the cust- it's to engage the owner, like get into a conversation, talk, you know what I mean? Act completely normal, like, you know, like an everyday folk. Going in there with, like, you know, with your snapback pulled over your eyelids, like some movie or something, trying to avoid the cameras, is probably the worst way to go shop, if anything. But anyway, I digress. So in stores, I'll have someone standing next to the doors, um, waiting for you to come out. Or when you know, just stand there. For instance, saying hi. You think they're saying hi because they like you. No, it's because it's the terror. If you're a thief, the idea is that if someone says hi to you and acknowledges your presence, it's going to put you off from seeing something. So that obviously is flawed, dumb idea. But they also extend that to you know people that don't look like they're going to shop in that brand, in that company or that brand. But it happens a lot. In some sense, you can take it. It's similar to that experience. I remember my little brother had when he went for an interview in Brick Lane for a skate shop that he didn't know was a skate shop. Right? He sent in a, no. He sent in a CV. I think he just didn't know what to wear, so he went he went safe and wore a suit, which is fucking nuts. Imagine going to a skate store and wearing a suit. So he turned up there and wore a suit to, to have an interview for the role. I think it was a skate store. I forgot what this, there's a streetwear store. So no skate store. What I forgot what that store was called. It's across the road from Rough Trade. It's opposite Rough Trade in Brick Lane on Truman. Is it Truman Brick? Wherever that thing is. Um and he went there in a suit to have an interview. And of course my brother, little brother, having been around me, knows most of the things that these kids know about stuff. But his look straight away kind of screamed some guy that was once the be a salesman next right he didn't look like he, he knew anything about the culture so of course he immediately got judged he had a good interview he said he spoke really well about the brands that he likes and blah blah but the suit just like you know the moment you walk into that three second rule thing right about you know we make our impression of somebody in three seconds the immediate look is so him in a suit ill-fitting with some fucking shitty wallabies automatically they thought he doesn't get the culture when he obviously does get the culture and the same could be said for the luxury designer brands, right? They will, you walk into the store, they'll think it's because you're not wearing something from a past season because you don't have anything fashionable on that obviously you don't want to, you know, you don't know what's going on in there and you're obviously only in there to cause mischief. Now, I'll give them some kind of bell, right? Because sometimes, sometimes it can be true. It can be true that the people that do go into the store who look the most shiftiest are going to do the shiftiest things. I've worked in retail and unfortunately sometimes, you know, it is it is our own people from some extent. But I would also say that most of the time these people that are coming from outside of the kind of culture, let's say, who are black, who are whatever, who are brown and want to shop in these places, they are shopping, they are kind of shopping there as they'll shop anywhere else, right? They don't need, they don't feel the need to kind of dress up for you or to kind of impress you or to kind of make you feel like comfortable that, hey, I can afford what is in there. And plus, these customers really hold your brand up to high esteem. So if someone is coming in there from the hood get wearing a tracksuit, maybe give that kid a chance because he might have saved up all his money to come and splurge it on Machino. That's just a fucking shit brand anyway, if, to be honest, right? For kids. But imagine, he's the one that's making your brand cool. He's going to take your jeans that you want worn one way, wear it another way, everyone's going to wear them and then they're going to sell out, right? Then what happens? Are you going to then stop the kids coming in buying those particular jeans? Are you going to pretend you don't have them in the back anymore? Doesn't make any sort of sense whatsoever. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And there's plenty of occasions you hear of people purposely going to side stop in, in tight shores, stores, sorry, whether they're CEOs or founders or even really rich people wealthy from wealthy families purposely going in dressed a certain way in order to see how the how the cuss how the sales actually treat customers and this preferential treatment is fucking crazy because you know you can't really judge anyone by the what they're what they're wearing sometimes in my experience working in retail sometimes the people that are war have are dressed the best who have the best stuff on are usually the the, the biggest dicks right because they're entitled they have they have they're 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 expecting a level of service right and they want you to meet that level of service which is sometimes super lofty sometimes you can meet it but they come in there with an attitude they have their nose up in the air do you know what i mean like they're the worst people to serve in all in all honesty so this is fucking insane and again the invasion of privacy taking pictures of people's license plates in the parking lot Ah, what you doing what you doing man manage the store why are you at the back taking pictures of people's fucking cars like, what the fuck is that going to do? Absolute psycho. Absolute psycho. And again, if you had a good lawyer, imagine you stole something from a machine store. You ran, you ducked out, right? The car was in another place and you got out. But the manager happened to walk down the street, take a picture of your thing, come back in again. Your lawyer could probably argue and get you off of it on a technicality because this, this fucking person invaded your privacy and took a picture of your license plate without your knowledge. Like, what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? Anyway, um, it continues. Um... The article says here, in addition to the Serena code word, which I don't really get as well. What's the Serena thing? Why Serena? Serena Williams is an amazing um, um, icon of sports of sportsmen all over the place. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't get the Serena thing. Um, Sabak would take pictures of the car. Da, da, da. I mean, late Mar- in late March 2018, one day after she contacted Machino's corporate staff for the second time in light of this continued discriminatory harassing and regulatory behavior, Sabak claims that she fired her. 
Imagine this, this is the thing that's always annoying though, isn't it? Right? This is what shows you about the lack of morality. That's why sometimes with these public freak out videos, you know, the videos of people when they're like, you know, they're in shops and they're like, Oh, I'm recording you. I'm gonna send it, oh you I can't wear it to get on YouTube, I can't wear it to get on corporate. It's annoying and these guys are dicks. Sometimes, you know, you can sometimes think, you know, they're the biggest pussies in the world. But I get it when they say that because sometimes these companies that act really quickly and fire people, right? Like that lady at a Chipotle that we saw a video of a few weeks ago. Um, these black kids come into Chipotle, or these kids in general come into Chipotle, they're trying to order some, you know, some Chipotle wrap, whatever. And then, um, of course, the manager is overheard. You can see this, as the video starts, the manager is overheard saying to them that um, they, 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 they won't be able to serve those kids and, and to, unfortunately, they won't serve them um, until they pay first, right? Which is not something that happens to Chipotle. Similar to Subway, right? You order your thing first and then you pay at the end. And, everyone, and then the kids are like, oh my God, why? Why is it because I'm black? They're, they're saying stuff, right? And you're like, oh shit, this woman's discriminating against these kids, right? Making them pay for a rap when everyone else is paying at the end. So then, it, you know, the video goes viral and then the Chipotle manager gets fired. Cool, everyone's fine. Social justice wins again. Then it kind of comes out, the story comes out that supposedly these kids were, I think the story comes out that I think someone found the tweets of those kids who recorded the video, old tweets, and they say something along the lines of they go to shops on purpose, like, you know, and they go and order things and then run out. That's the thing that they do, whether it's a game, whether it's somewhere to get free food, whatever it may be, or to become viral hits on the internet. They do this occasion all the time, right? So that manager was, has experience with those kids and was making sure that, you know, risk what's that called um loss prevention would make sure to don't lose much stock she's like saying i know you guys you come here all the time you have to pay first but we lost that in in the context of it we just saw this manager discriminating against these black kids and we automatically went to a conclusion and that happens a lot sometimes so sometimes these companies are quick to fire people but they don't they don't act on the time what happens i'm sure that manager complained a couple of times to corporate hey we've got these kids out coming in they're stealing all the thing what can we do the corporate didn't want to touch didn't want to touch it and the moment it comes out it goes a viral they make an action and all suddenly stand on their fucking morality high horse so i mean she knows the same sort of thing i'm sure that she complained many plenty of times of corporate um to about the manager which is hard to do i'm assuming you know complaining about a manager and saying they're treating you wrongly isn't gonna be the best thing is gonna really you know um is going to really endear you to the staff members. I'm sure she complained, but nothing happened. And now look, now it's all of a sudden it's going to court. Machine's getting dragged in the mud. Reputation's getting destroyed. Fucking crazy. Anyway, it continues. Um, da, da, da. So she was fired. And later, da, da, da. so she was fired saying, tomorrow will be your last day due to the sequence of events. Contact corporate like you have been doing. Crazy, this manager. And absolute, absolute um, balls of steel. As a result of foregoing... Of the, of the foregoing, Latitude has set forth 17 different claims, including breach of conduct, race harassment, discrimination, religious harassment, discrim and discrimination, gender harassment, everything harassed, harassment. Jesus Christ, she is seeking monetary damage, including triple damages since the defendant's misconduct was committed intentionally in a malicious, oppressive, fraudulent manner. Machina has said in a statement it complies with amicable employment loss, prevents uh, values and respectable customers. Jesus Christ, the lawsuit comes two years after the Versace employee filed a lawsuit against the Italian brand. Yeah, man, they're fucking done. They they are done. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. And that manager's probably still employed by Machino, isn't suspended due pending investigation, still there talking shit. And again, these brands, man, this is, this is what I'm saying. These and it comes from the top down. This is not this is not just the manager's fault. This is something that comes from the culture of that company overall. Where a manager feels like they can do this. Like that culture exists. Like when you it's like when you remember when Steve Jobs was around. Nowadays it's not so much the same thing. But when you used to work into going to an Apple store, how happy, clappy everyone was, right? The cult of fucking Apple. You go in there, people will be super stoked about working in the store. They love technology, they love Apple. It's similar to that extent now, don't get me wrong, but it's waned. It's not as like happy clappy it was before in the start. But that kind of culture started from the top down, right? That was corporate taking a very uh taking a lot of interest into how the tone of the store reflected everything that they do with the company overall so if, so when you're hearing these kind of stories don't think it's isolated don't think this manager and machine in west hollywood is just acting on her own she's obviously or he whatever the person is i'm not sure if it's a, if it's a girl or not ran so i'm not sure if it's a girl or whatever right this manager is taking on the cues that's happening from corporate whether it's how they treat their whether it's how they refer to their customers in china whether it's how they refer to their customers in europe whether it's how they refer to middle east customers that's why i always had a bit it used to always Leave a sour taste in my mouth whenever I work somewhere and you'd have a group channel where people would be complaining about customers or like posting stuff, what they said and stuff. It always kind of let the sour taste in my mouth because in general, it you know, it's, it, there is stuff you can laugh about. But I think in general, laughing at customers can sometimes breed a little bit of discontent of contempt in general. Do you know what I mean? Like you can kind of and that can kind of seep into the way you treat them, the way you service them on the app itself or the service, whatever it may be. 
And in general, like I said, I, f- I just think I wish there'll be more of a stand. I wish some black people would take a stand against these brands that don't support you. If they don't support you, don't back them, right? Similar to what the Hen- Henny Palooza uh, stuff did, right? Um, that party in in America where they tried to get sponsorship with Henny Palooza with with Henny Henny do say whatever Henny yeah yeah Henny. Um, but they did, didn't want to do it or they backed out, whatever it may be. And then they went to Duse, which was owned by, you know, Jay-Z and all that malarkey. And they kind of like, you know, bought into that whole idea and were able to kind of sponsor their events and become the official drink sponsor. So much so that now the event's called Duse Palooza, right? And that whole idea comes from the idea of like, these guys don't want you, right, to be promoting their brand. They want to be associated with our culture, but they want to take our money. They want to make sure, you know, they, they they love reaping the rewards of it. They love having it in the videos and stuff, but they don't want to send you any free products. They don't have any official collaborations with you. Then fuck them all to help, right? Only support the ones that are supporting you. But unfortunately, sometimes, I don't know, I think our morality compasses are a bit skewed. In the same way how you're seeing with this R. Kelly documentary, you know, his kind of streaming numbers have spiked since the documentary has kind of aired. More and more people want to go see him live in shows. People are defending him. Women in, in general too. It, I don't know what people are right. So I'd, I'd like to see people take a stand and be like you know what fuck it no more machinery until they get the practices in order until they kind of root out this kind of um discrimination in their stores because it happens all over the place right i can go to saint laurent tomorrow and be dressed like i don't listen to indie music or i don't care about who heidi samen was previously and i would get discriminated in i I could do probably the same thing going to balenciaga which is a very kind of you know youth oriented uh fashion brand which is primarily worn by people that are black or brown or yellow for the most part and i would get discriminated again so i mean there are these things that happen a lot and it doesn't make any sense because the people that are making your brand popular who are kind of making people come in there and want to buy the stuff or saving money up or saving however measly wages they're getting for six seven eight nine twelve months to kind of purchase that one thing you know they're the ones that make it popular and you come in there and you're treating them absolute shit and because they're you know new slaves as Kanye West says because we're so um we're so attached to the brand not even the fucking designer or the store we care about the brand so much we're, for, we're willing to forego it remember that story of Tory Lanez in a super mall somewhere in Canada I don't know where it was somewhere in a mall and he got discriminated against in the shop and he came back the next day and spent I don't know 30 racks whatever $30,000 and kind of you know was sniggering at stuff you know like who won there really did he won because he come back with more money and showed them that he could buy it for the stuff or the day one because ultimately he's giving them their money do you know what I mean capitalism always wins in that respect so yeah um disgusting behavior from machino um disgusting behavior for the man disgusting machine this behavior from the company of rule because they're the ones that are making the manager feel like that kind of action that kind of discriminating behavior is okay and i just wish people take more of a stand this girl's gonna fucking cash out i'm sure she is so that um, that i have no problem with um but yeah i wish people would take more of a stand against it but i know they're not that people don't really care about these kind of things over in general as long as they can get their thing that's what they care about but hey ho ho we can only hope we can only hope next on the list u.s restaurants are struggling to find cheap labor um mildly mildly interesting i saw this on tiktok on uh twitter earlier on uh quickly at a table which kind of maybe makes sense lends itself a little bit to what i was talking about before um about how i found it difficult to get my first job straight out of college or whatever it may be but i saw this uh, video on tiktok quickly show it here so this is on tiktok and this video says, um, let's go back to the beginning. Restaurants struggling to find cheap labor. As the US economy reports low employment uh, and fewer teenagers are part of the workforce. Uh, restaurants notice few applications for low wage work. In 1968, 50% of 15 and 17 year olds had jobs. And by 2018, only 19 were employed, which is fucking weird, isn't it? And I don't, I don't really know what that is. I wonder why kids don't want to get jobs. I wonder. Is it because everyone's kind of hoping they're going to become a Vine star or something? Um, I wonder, like, what is the reason you'd think that kids are not applying for jobs anymore, for low pay jobs, especially now where um, everyone kind of, we have more access to media, right? Social media in that respect. We see more things. Um, everyone has access to cool things, right? Streetwear and all that sort of stuff isn't something that's like um, only resigned to a, a really small niche group of people on the underground and forums and stuff. Everyone kind of knows about the cool stuff. Everyone wants to kind of wear all the, all the best brands. You'd, you'd imagine those kids would want to have the money in order to kind of afford it, right? Off their own back and not have to ask their parents in order to kind of buy a box or a hoodie. You'd assume that, wouldn't you, for the most part? So I don't really, I'm not really sure why that's actually happened, why the kids don't want to get jobs. But anyway, let's continue quickly with this article, read this video, sorry, get back on here. Amazon and Walmart and Target have all increased their minimum wage. Obviously, I'm assuming to kind of draw those kids in. 
uh, making it even harder for restaurants. Okay, no. So make it harder for restaurants to compete. So okay, so the kids want to work for the Amazon, the Netflix, all those kind of places. They don't want. They don't want to have. They don't want to work for McDonald's or these kind of places and get those intermediary roles. Right? They'd rather jump up straight, which is again, it's quite rare, isn't it? Because I don't think most people. I have met some people who have come come straight out of college and landed a brilliant office job on like twenty one thousand a year. Right when I spent most of my um, adulthood or te- especially early 20s and maybe yeah maybe up until 23 the highest i've ever earned was maybe 20,000 or 19 or something jeremy i always spent my time on those kind of low wage roles that you're working in retail was usually about 18,000 a year or whatever maybe right um maybe more if you include overtimes but some people are kind of quite fortunate where they were able to come out of college just do you know i mean hit the 22,000k straight away and at that age if you're doing that imagine if you know if you kind of you know stay there a few more years you get some more experience you're gonna fucking blow um, so let's continue this mentions are reported wary are wary of ways and wages as they look to avoid raising menu prices which is fair instead some are turning to unique ways to recruit workers um taco Bell started having hiring parties with free nachos and while mcdonald's and church chicken will focus on senior citizens in 2019 which is interesting yeah i've seen that actually um a lot of those kind of fast food chains are kind of trying to focus on getting um senior citizens in to kind of work those roles because they're quite trustworthy and they kind of get on with the job right not many sick days and that stuff like you it's not many sick days if you're seeing a citizen you're just gonna die right you're not gonna have a sick day you're just gonna say hey i'm tapping out by the way and then you don't come back in again but um now i'm interested because I, I think it's weird because I think if I was a young person, right, I would necess- I wouldn't try I, as alluring as it may be to want to work for Amazon, Airbnb, Netflix and stuff. I would aim for working for a restaurant when I come out of college or university because those jobs are the easiest to get, right? And they're jobs that don't really require much mental acumen, right? So if you wanted to be a producer, you wanted to, um, I don't know, do a short course on the side, you wanted to become a designer, you wanted to have your own brand, you wanted to be a musician, whatever it may be, right? You could do that on the side or even during your lunch break and it wouldn't take away from the work you're doing because work is quite monotonous, right? You even working on the, you know, even constructing the burger itself on the on the line of it as a line cook, whatever it may be. It's just a case of putting stuff together in a certain order. Obviously, there's certain quality standards you have to meet, menus about memorizing where certain thing goes on the on a button. Most of it's touchscreen. You're used to using that touchscreen technology with stuff you're using at home. So they're fairly easy jobs to get easy jobs to do they don't require a lot of your mental uh, capacity and that would be well up for it and plus you can bounce around you can take time off you can quit whenever you want do you know what i mean it's like they don't they're not gonna it's not gonna hamper your cv if you work time at for two weeks and then just quit do you know what i mean and start somewhere else like you can do that whereas if you get an office job that is obviously higher paying might have more benefits towards it you might get health insurance or whatever malarkey you might get dental care you might get cycle to work incentives but you're quite locked in right you're working five days a week you're working nine to five, nine to six, wherever it may be. You're locked in those hours. You can't really go any, anywhere else apart from the weekends. Sometimes if you're, if you're in a senior role, like I have been in my other previous roles, it requires you to stay in, stay at work a few more hours. You might be doing nine to eights because you're a senior person. You have to do things. You have to go to meetings. Even though you travel for work and it seems amazing, that means you're always working because those times that you're traveling to work sometimes might bleed into your weekends. Loads of things that, that get affected by it and just locks you in. Don't necessarily need to. And again, when you're young, you want to be nimble. You want to be you want to be trying different things at the same time. Unless you want to be actually an office person, just earn a wage and just shut the fuck up and get on with life. Fair enough. But I think usually when you're that age, when you're between, I don't know, coming out of uni from 18 to 24, 25, you should be fucking around, man. You should be getting a few shitty jobs. You should be moving around from place to place and seeing what kind of works for you. And then eventually, then maybe locking yourself into something that you want to do more long term. But it's interesting to see. I'm happy to see that they're not trying to raise minimum wages. And they, because again, like I said, they won't be able to compete in general. You can't. You, there's no way a, a McDonald's can, will compete with Amazon's um, entry level wages. But they're all, always going to offer an option of like, you know, working in a branch that's probably close to where you live. Um, the uniform is a bit shitty don't get me wrong but for the most part it's quite cool i'd imagine it'd be quite fun to work in mcdonald's especially if you've got a good group of people working alongside with you um in and out you don't have to stay any longer than where you have than what you have to work fairly innocuous but again i, I don't know maybe these kids are, have are smarter than me and are getting money other ways and they need to work and on this job i don't know i don't know what else is next here <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. Impossible Burger. This is fucking cool. I'm sure other people have seen it. I haven't. Well, I, it's the first time I've seen it the other day, actually. So there's this burger called the Impossible Burger that's in, that's entirely made out of plant-based mm. products, right? And I had no idea this thing existed. And supposedly, it looks like, from the video I've seen, and supposedly some people are saying how it tastes, it, it, it actually looks and tastes like something... Um, uh, 
it actually tastes and looks a, a lot like me, right? Which is fucking amazing. So if this, if they can somehow get that to a level where you know someone like me, I'm not, I'm not the most. I eat meat, but I'm not the most um, pro carnivorous person out there, right? I'm not kind of flying the flag of meat eating. I'm not like on a fucking meat only diet, like Jordan Peterson or whatever it might be, right? And I'm also not that bothered if I don't have to, if I don't, ha- if I don't get to eat meat, right? I should be saying poor somewhere in between there, but fuck it, I'm not American, um, and you know, you know what I mean. Um, but um, if someone was able to give me a substitute, right? Um, especially if it came to burgers, it came to having steak, especially for like meal preps, stuff you're going to eat during the week. You don't necessarily bothered about having, and especially, especially in terms of um, affordability, maybe buying an absolutely 100% organic uh, farm-raised um, beef steak every week might not be the best thing for you. Maybe even for your systems overall, eating that much meat every week might not be the best thing for you. But in general, if it was something I had to eat for the week, during the week, or something that might just mix it up when I'm going to a restaurant, so they're always getting the same old fucking cheeseburger thing, I would love to have a plant a plant based burger that tastes like steak but wasn't steak. That'd be amazing. So this this burger is called Impossible Burger. They launched a new one actually, I think um C is it on C during CES um this week, I think uh impossible burger 2.0 but it's kind of a video that kind of details a little bit about it i think some of it's annotated so i'm going to annotate the bits that aren't for the listeners of via the video and then i via the audio and then for you video watchers you can watch along so you've got some burgers up so here our lunch grill. today is going to be the, the grilled Possible. burgers this is like a lettuce wrap wow. these are little skewers with the chimichurri sauce it actually looks like a burger. Impossible Foods has updated his Impossible Burger, um, which is made entirely from plants. Fucking insane how they did that, isn't it? We visited Impossible Foods kitchen and research lab for a test, for a taste, sorry, test, and to see how it stacks up to real beef. Amazing, amazing. Plant-based burger looks like one. really made up of four different components. So there's the proteins, the flavors, and the aromas, and the binders, and the fat. Now in the the new recipe is a soy protein, so that's uh, different than before, which is a wheat protein. So it now has a much like beefier chew and this sort of coarse grind that consumers expect from a really high quality mm. meat. And what we do is we take the dry soy protein and we hydrate it with the water and potato protein, and then the magic ingredient is heme. That and is mad, protein- isn't it? How they can somehow get soy protein to look like fucking meat, right? Even just in a bowl, you can do a tail once it kind of gets mashed in together match together and binded that it's going to take the appearance of steak that is fucking nuts i'm not a fan of the vegan products that are like <clears throat> super fatty like chicken wings or like you know macaroni and cheese like vegan made or nuggets and stuff where they're just trying to replicate you know fast food stuff done in a vegan way um that's not a fan of because you know essentially those kind of people are the same type of you know um usually um overweight people who love to eat vegan only foods and are clearly overweight because they you know they're mostly eating starchy processed foods but i think stuff like this is there's definitely scope for it to go on further in my opinion i would probably prefer to eat this as opposed to there was that um what was that company that was making a lab uh lab created um in a from a petri dish um steak right or kind of engineering it from a through a computer or whatever it may be i'd be more comfortable eating a plant-based uh uh steak a beef burger right that tasted like it than actually something that created in computer personally for me anyway potato protein is also where we have all of our flavor precursors in beef uh and then we replicate that exact same flavor generation upon cooking but just by wow. starting with ingredients from plants wow and so all of these sort That's of so cool. nutrients amino acids and sugars uh that then create like the natural delicious flavor when you brown meat you know the smell and everything that is all uh, in this in this ingredient here. That is mad, once isn't it? it's been hydrated then we add heme so heme like i said is our magic ingredient it's the iron containing molecule that's found in all living plants and animals we use a cellulose based binding system um and that is a really important ingredient that helps to create juiciness in our product so actually as it uh as you cook it and it, it sort of solidifies it releases water wow. so it helps to hold it together in the raw state that is mad bro state. one of the things we wanted to do was lower the total fat and the saturated fat and the way we're able to do that is remove some of the coconut oil and replace it with sunflower oil and now that we're using the soy protein it's made without gluten and the gluten-free claim is, is pending and should be next year. That is cool. So the major improvements are the entire sensory experience yeah, where we now look have at a that. much Even in easier, hand, juicier that product. Looks, that the looks nutrition is like better, uh, where we have a higher quality She's protein, lower, up, lower fat, full, and lower wow, sodium. That is insane. Um, and then what we're most excited about is the improved versatility. Uh, so 
now you can grill this. Wow, that is insane. That is literally insane. I can't wait to taste some of this, man. Hopefully, I'm not sure if it's out already yet, but that looks super insane. So it's all grilling on a on a you grill now. It looks exactly like a burger. You can do meatballs. Uh, you can do a bolognese sauce, so it now holds up to uh, soups and sauces, a chili, anything you could possibly think of. That is with insane. Beef that is insane. Do. We have tried it in Instapot. As Instapots are getting more and more popular, um, and yeah, it works. It works really well. Yeah, like so that, that's the Impossible Burger, hundred percent plant based uh, beef burger alternative. That is looks fucking insane. Looks really cool. And again, like I said, there's so much scope for it. For someone like me who kind of isn't that you know bothered if I don't eat meat every single day, I, do, I wouldn't mind a plant based alternative, especially considering that if I you know outside of maybe the eggs that I eat and maybe outside of maybe some chicken salads that I make, I can easily replace um, most of the. Um, animal protein in my in my diet but i need some good alternatives right that aren't um which, what's that word called what's that thing that everyone eats anyway there aren't the things that people normal that the folk nowadays that eat vegan eat and something like this like a plant-based alternative to steak will be right up my alley if they could somehow replicate this with fucking chicken with chicken Woo! they got chicken involved i think us black people will be lining up and banging on their doors but yeah this looks insane i can't wait to see it i can't wait to buy it myself when it comes to store so it's impossible burger that um they debuted 2.0 at c is it cas right did they do that um what did they put it's on scene anyway i'll link the video in the show notes you can check out yourself but i think it debuted at ces but that's the impossible burger 2.0 What's next on the list here? Um, JW Anderson Hacking Converse. I fucking love these, man. JW Anderson is one of my favorite designers out, um, um, British, well, British wise. And I guess for the most part, I don't, I'm not sure he gets the the credit he deserves. I've, I've heard a few people in Show Studio kind of talk about him in disparaging terms, but I think in terms of um, the taste level, his aesthetic, his references, of course, coming from a contemporary art background, something that I've always leaned myself towards more so. I kind of I love designers who kind of, you know, pull references from the contemporary art world because usually those references are a little bit more abstract. They come from various different places. Sometimes the fashion influences and references can be a little bit um, narrow, right? Because sometimes only harp on collections from other brands, from other seasons who without doing it in their own way or updating it or talking about something that's happening right now in the current state of the world blah 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 it's always done in a very haphazard way like kind of kind of like chanel when they did that fake protest or it's done in a super avant-garde where you can't understand what the fuck's going on right sometimes in prada where the clothes look amazing but you have no idea where references come from so i like sometimes when you're kind of in the middle and i think jada renson does a good way of kind of making stuff commercial but also having the nice references for people like me who give a shit about reading into stuff and these converse um jw Anderson hiking boots look amazing i've been a fan of so far these converse i think the ones that came out before the glitter ones right with the kind of split colors on either side it's annoyed me a lot because obviously converses um the shape of the shoe and the shape of my feet don't necessarily marry up that well but i think i might have to take the bullet and just try and squeeze my massive gorilla feet into these shoes so they're essentially like a standard converse i'm assuming 70s upper that everyone's using nowadays the converse one star they did a, a actually converse did an amazing job bringing that shape back into the um the current lexicon of footwear and updating it and kind of taking the inspiration from obviously archive model and kind of reissuing it i think converse did a good job i obviously did a good job with the stance and that got reintroduced but i think this model converse is something that's been very very underrated um this i think it's i think it's the one star right uh is it the converse what is it what model is it actually what model is it built i'm not too sure it doesn't say here but um yeah so this is the exclusive look at the com agenda means of in converse uh run star hike in white so i'm assuming it's a new model that's going to be it because usually what happens with brands with a collaboration they'll use a collaboration in order to kind of launch a model because they don't want to test it in the open market because you know consumers for the most part don't take risk right they're only going to take a risk for a brand because it's a hype product or whatever and they can kind of add to the cachet you can obviously get the benefit of bringing in their customers a jd americans and customer into a converse environment but your idea is hopefully is that if if that's limited edition and release kind of quote unquote gets out and people buy it then they're obviously going to iterate it further on into other collections that they do and um yeah this is nice man i fucking love it i absolutely love this shoe i think it looks amazing i saw it in a runway uh collection i think i think the last uh, i think it might have been spring summer um 
um, the last Jada Venture collection. I remember the, the models wearing it and I liked how it looked there. And obviously it's come out now. So we're going to see it coming out soon. And it looks incredible. I fucking love it. I think it looks amazing. So essentially you've got a converse up. You've got a converse on the upper with a kind of like a stacked sole, hiking sole for the most part. It looks similar to a pair of acne boots that came out recently. And also it looks a bit similar to the JD Manson shoe that came out. Remember the one that came out? I think JD Manson where it sort of like a, uh, had a really, really long pointed toe that kind of like bent up was like clown shoes. It kind of looks like a little bit of a play on Mary on those kind of things now at the moment. And I, I just love it. I think it looks fucking incredible as a shoe person. I think it's going to be, I'm not sure if everyone's going to wear it. I'm not sure if everyone's taste, but for me, I love it. Nice bit of fox on the front that gives it a nice bit of detail. And yeah, again, for me, it's, I'm all over it. I fucking love the shoe. I think it looks amazing. Nice profile would work very well with most outfits. I think for the most part, imagine these in black or in navy with the white sole. Ooh, would be so good. So this come, this is coming out on January sixteenth. It's going to retail for one hundred and twenty pounds, which is not too bad actually, considering what it looks like. Personally, I think it's a nice model there. So yeah, JW Anderson, um, Converse, Run Star, Hike in White. Cannot wait for this to come out. If I have money on that day, I will purchase and maybe do a review. What's next? Uh, Com de Garçon and Nike Nike Presto, right? Yeah, these look interesting too. Um, they look a sim, they look similar. You know what they remind me of? These shoes. I saw this earlier, and they kind of remind me of. Um, do you remember? Oh, let me try to get up actually. Uh, Com de Garçon. Do you remember the? Do you remember that studio? What's that studio? I think it's called Studio Hago. It's like a Dutch design studio. And they do like um they do they do mashups of shoes and different styles and stuff. I think they might have done some stuff with Virgil and helped him do that off-white shoe that a lot of people were wearing that sort of like looks like it's flipped out inside out or outside in. And I think they've done a few other things. I think they might have lent a hand in designing the Kendrick Lamar Cortez that has the sort of like a zip tie on the laces. I remember them doing a, a, a prototype of that. But it's a really amazing kind of a product design uh, studio, right? I think it's called Studio Hago. Let me show you and see if I can get up. Studio Hago. Instagram. I think it's called Studio Hygo. They do like um they do like um trainers for the most part. Little updates on them, right? Uh, oh here it is. I've got it. So it's Studio Hygo. I think it's it's not is it Amsterdam base? I'm assuming, right? Yeah. Uh Fortware Design Consultancy uh studio in Amsterdam. So this is the place. And I remember they, they do so this show I'm about to show you from Com de Garçon and Nike reminds you of something that Studio Hago will do, right? So loads of really interesting shapes i think these these are a lot of the new designs that they're probably doing working with companies but a lot of the stuff they were kind of just doing on their own um <laughs> i like that what they did here with the cold war yeah so this is the this is the shoe that i thought kind of the kendrick lamar uh quarters might have been based off of um this is obviously an illustration it looks like let's look at some other stuff blah, 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 blah. scroll down yeah, so they got some cool stuff here. I remember this Converse here that looked really cool with the straps all over it. An amazing update on the Converse one star. So it looks similar to something that Studio Hagel would do, right? This might have been something they did with the off-white shoe that released a while back. That might be where the inspiration came from. It's annoying that with Instagram and web, you have to kind of go to the corner and click the X before you could just like, you know, get off of it. But anyway, let's flip through some more pictures here. Some more on feet. Reebok there. Play on it. So yeah, they did some interesting stuff overall. I think con content and prototype wise, they always did interesting work. Some of it, I'm not sure if it's all official collaboration. I'm not sure some of it is like them trying to get work or secure um, design projects, whatever it may be. But they do some really interesting stuff. Oh yeah, the, the, the Kashi Murakami Air Force Ones that he wore during the, I think the gallery opening for the stuff that he did with Virgil, and it was really cool. Um, in general, just an amazing little design studio. So I saw this um um call. What did I say? I saw this um. Presto, they did with uh, in collaboration. Oh no, Common the Garza did in collaboration with um, with Nike, obviously, right? So let me show you if I can get it up. It looks similar to what Studio Hago do. Nike Presto, com. There you go. Da, 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 da. Let's see if I can get it up here. So I thought this looked fairly cool, man. Very interesting model. I'm a big fan of Presto again, just because of my feet and because I got fucking wide toes. Sometimes your toes can stick out in the front. And regards of sometimes because my feet are wide, if I get a longer size, if I get like a longer basically shoe. It won't fit the same still. Do you know what I mean? It'll still, my toes will still be scrunching up at the front. So sometimes it can be a bit of an issue in that regard. But um, let me see this. So I still have more pretzel, but I really like the Presto model. So here it is on screen. You've got a Comte de Home Plus. Amazing Nike Air Presto. I think that, again, debuted in the question before we saw maybe last season where the models were kind of had really puffed up hair. I think they were wearing it during that, that, during that runway. 
Um, yeah, and it looks amazing then. So it's kind of like a sock on top of it, it looks like, right? Or like a tent. I'm not sure if that is meant to inspiration is coming from, but it looks amazing. The colorway itself of the Presto looks really nice. I, I'm, I'm always a big fan of, you know, black neon neon yellow sort of like mesh lineup look like. It looks similar. Maybe it's an acronym sort of like style shoe, but colors look amazing. The teal looks really nice, baby blue sort of color. And I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a visor from a helmet. For something like the Martians or something, or even though it's a tent, but I just love the outside sock of it. It looks really interesting, again, um, and a really clever way of kind of doing uh, Prestos and maybe a more contemporary model. And when are these due to come out? Are these coming out again? Oh, and the 12 too. So these are coming out at the same time, the uh, hiking boots, the Converse hiking boots from um, J.W. Anderson. But these look very interesting. I like the look of them. So I'm interested to see what happens. And again, this is another model that probably is going to get iterated out in general release. They're going to, you know, do a designer color lab first. And they're going to probably make these um, GR um, later on. So we probably might see some more colorways of this coming up soon. We're interested to see if they get pop, if they're popular with uh, customers over all over, all over. Or if you know, if actual Presto fans will like the colorway and just kind of cut the tent out. Because I've seen people sometimes do that sometimes with their shoes. They want to cut some bits out because they don't really like how it looks. But personally for me, I'm not a fan of that. You know, buy it as it is. And if you don't like it, buy something else. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, next on the list here. Oh, I actually want to talk about that one. The bar is out, but who cares? Um, oh, Anthea or Anita. There, so uh, loads of DJ mixes out there that are fucking amazing. Everyone's doing great work, of course. But one that really stuck, stuck out to me recently that I've been listening to a lot was this Boiler Room set from a DJ called Anita, right? Um, she runs uh, a club night in, uh, sorry, in France called Blockhouse. Um, which is really popular with the scene over there. She's kind of spearheading um, the introduction of techno with some of her partners and they run some good parties and she's one of the resident DJs there. And obviously, um, you know, me being a big Boiler Room fan, uh, the last one I went to was quite recently for the Young Bane show, but I've been to go to Boiler Room probably since it first started. Um, and, you know, I've always had some fun memories of the early days of it. But as some some people have noticed watching the videos online sometimes, depending on where it is, I'm not sure if it's the people that are there and I'm not sure if it's the setup, which makes you overly self-conscious because you usually have the DJ in the middle and with cameras kind of facing them and you can kind of you kind of know you might end up on YouTube but usually the crowd is a bit dead right in boiler room events um, it'll be an amazing DJ playing you'll hit you'll probably hear the set sometimes audio wise sometimes you might hear it because you listen to it online or you might just watch the video you'll be like oh this DJ is fucking smashing it why aren't people dancing more and it kind of bums you out sometimes right like people aren't letting themselves go but sometimes you know you can't blame them because you know they're in a boiler room arena they know they're getting filmed they're maybe a bit self-conscious but sometimes the crowd can be a bit shitty so but it was nice for a once to have like a dj playing who obviously got it who obviously was smashing it but also have a crowd that was fucking losing their minds and this set honestly this set like every bit you skip forward to in a video everyone is going crazy so i re highly recommend you check it out um and and anita i'm not sure you remember some parents name anita anita right playing a uh, boiler room i think this is in amsterdam looks like a skate looks like a skate shop or something or skate store or skate arena i think so get up on here but yeah, it's an amazing, it's an amazing, amazing uh, set. Obviously, the setting helps. Boiler Room always smash it with kind of like alternative kind of places they get um, DJs to play in arenas and stuff. So that's always a nice surprise. And just the setting, it being, I'm not sure if it's a skate shop, I'm not sure if it's a skate arena, what they say in the description here. Uh, party at Skate Cafe, right? So I'm assuming it's like a, you know, a, a kind of hybrid space, cafe store and all that stuff, malarkey with a skate shop in it. but. Just in general, people like, you know, raving on a ramp, everyone losing their minds, you know, it being a, a girl that looks cool, she's got a great outfit on, great rings, a lot of details. And one thing that I noticed watching the video, if you scan through, there's tons of girls in here, tons. I'm not sure, now again, I'm not sure if it's Amsterdam, a re, Amsterdam electronic scene for the most part, or I'm not sure if it's Amsterdam because they just have more females there than guys do. I'm not sure if girls like to go out. But if, I'm not, and I'm not sure, again, if it's to do with Anifa being a woman, and DJing right at a very high level that you know other girls too are going to come out and support their own I'm not sure if that's a thing I'm not sure if loads of girls go out and see Nina Kravitz or loads of girls go out and see Black Madonna I'm not sure if that's a thing if it is uh, someone let me know but I'm not sure but if it is a thing then I think that's fucking awesome and it kind of made me revise my idea when it came to, you know, the whole um, conflict with female DJs in the electronic music scene, right? Female, uh, especially in the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of articles on resident advisors of, um, uh, I think there's one in London, actually, a female-based um, radio station that's kind of primarily, you know, it's not discriminating, of course, but it's kind of trying to uh, steer its programming around um, it towards kind of like promoting new female voices within the electronic music scene. You see loads of club nights that only book females or people that identify as females 
females. You see all these kind of stuff going around, right? And sometimes there's a guy that's also a DJ that's involved in the electronic community scene that runs his own night, that DJs a lot uh, over the weekends. You can sometimes get a little bit embittered sometimes and think, oh, that's annoying, right? Why are they doing that? Because, you know, if, you, if you're good, you'll get the chance anyway. doesn't matter. And sometimes you can feel like sometimes you know, if you're a woman and you're fairly attractive or you have a good style that you're going to get much better opportunities than a regular dude's going to get anyway because you just have that, you know, you, your, 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 your other gender that isn't maybe represented as well as it should be then you add on all the other kind of you know surface stuff it can obviously blow you up but then when you look at this video you can kind of say you know that's probably an immature point of view because what you're seeing is that what i saw when i went and maybe saw i don't know uh wbza right maybe play for the first time or you see maybe a dj EZ play for the first time or maybe when you're just in, in a rave and you see people that look like you or you bump into another black dude at a techno party in berlin and you give yourself give each other a fist bump right there is something about there is something about going into a space and see people that look like you that makes you feel comfortable right that makes you want to come back again how much more so when you're in a in the nightclub or you're in a techno party and all you hear especially just sonically right you hear just the perspective of men right and it just and again it's just I've, I've seen it i've kind of reflected just watching this video these are the thoughts that came to my head and you're always you're, you're hearing you're hearing this perspective of what a man thinks electronic music sounds like in that arena and you can't deny i think anyone that goes out and has heard a really high level females play in nightclubs you can't deny the difference when you go in and you hear females smashing it there is a certain taste level a certain aesthetic a certain sort of sonic um resonance going around the arena that could only be ascribed to the fact that this the person is coming is coming from their perspective of being a fo uh, being a female or being a certain age or being of a certain racial background being of a certain location and that's essentially what electronic music is about right this whole underground movement is about people from all these different areas all these different places around the world kind of congregating together underneath this umbrella of electronic electronic music right so we're, we're able to represent wherever we come from underneath this umbrella, which allows us all to come from the same place, right? We all feel at home when we go to these places. We don't feel ostracized, regardless of where you're from, um, what, what you're into, whatever it may be. And then I think maybe that's what it lends itself to this Anthea set. She's an incredible female DJ, and she's surrounded by a bevy of other female attendants there who are maybe getting inspiration from just seeing her play. They might not want to be DJs. They might not want to be anything to do electronic music, but just the fact that they're seeing somebody who looks like them fucking smashing in that arena is amazing and for the most part i think as a dude i think i don't give a shit like I, I think most guys don't care like if you're good at what you do and you're smashing it it's cool but i also think sometimes we can be a bit dismissive and think oh if you're good you're just gonna get a chance anyway i don't think that happens i think most clubs most festivals always program their things quite safe right they look at people's uh, instagram followers they look at how people big their people are releases blah, blah blah and that's how they book the events they don't usually take chances on djs regardless of um gender they don't take a chance on djs anyway they don't take a chance they won't take a chance on somebody that isn't well known they'll take they only go for the people that they know of so imagine if if you're only going to people that you know of and they only, and you're only choosing from a pool of people that are 90 percent going to be male of course you're not going to get female representation there and any place that you go especially outside and it comes to music for the most part it's made better when you have you know a, a mix of genders there it's not made better when it's just like a complete bevy of dudes unless you know it's like a pride month or whatever it may be it's quite cool to go to nightclubs and have like you know it it be mixed up for the for, for the most part and represent the music that people are listening to for the most part so i think it's quite nice to see this whole kind of drive in order to get more female djs involved or to get them booked in more big festivals because i'm sure there's loads out there i don't believe that there's not enough there's not enough female djs out there to, to put on the night there's loads of them out there you just have to give them the opportunity and allow them to know they have permission to play in these arenas sometimes you can feel like oh you go into these places it's all dudes it's all dudes dude music it's dude aesthetic and they can kind of dead out the scene but i think mixing up a little bit is always kind of the best thing and this um lady anthea uh guy or girl um um i don't care she's a fucking amazing dj and again like i said scan through this entire set and you're just gonna see people losing their mind like i said one of the best um visual as boy rooms you're gonna watch in a long 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 time people just having fun dancing no standing around the guy in the hat here fucking going for it like the whole thing is amazing i recommend you check it out i'll link it to him in the show notes you can check the actual whole set but she fucking smashes it really really good dj man really really good dj so i recommend you check it out again really really cool check that out um anthea at uh boiler room amsterdam dj set but i'll link in the show notes for everyone else that wants to check it da, 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 da. Anyway, that is an hour. We, we've hopped onto an hour. Um, I think this is a perfect place to kind of end things and bring it to a pause. Uh, one more episode left to, tomorrow for the week and then we're done. Um, big man's taking a break because he's got a whole DJ weekend full up and work to do and stuff. So man's busy in that, you know what I mean? So I'll see you guys um, 
tomorrow for the last episode of the week for that regard but before then thanks so much for tuning in and listening to me ramble for an hour or so it's a pleasure always mine as per usual find out more inspiration regarding moi please visit my site xnozinga.com you can find that in the show notes this podcast is also brought to you by audible claim you can claim a one free book credit and a 30 day free trial by visiting my link at audible.com for just aggie audible.com for just a double ggy to claim one free book credit one free book credit and a 30 day free trial 30 day free trial for you and yours to enjoy in this happy new year's um year that we're in right now anyway that's the excellent english show episode number 142 with you your host agostino and i'm out with you with me my host with me my host or you might know with me my host and i'm out peace <laughs>